I'm Tolu Lokwe, Adilaru Balogun. Our headline story, Suez Canal and Economic Disruption. As we hear that there is progress in moving the massive 400 meter ever given, six days after the container carrying vessel blocked the Suez Canal in Egypt, global trade is still reeling from the effect. Even crude oil has been impacted by the incident. Today, we'll look at the impact of the Suez Canal blockade on global trade and how it is affecting us on the continent. Welcome. This is Business Edge. We start with some good news that's coming from Egypt. The Ever Given has been course corrected about 80% according to the Suez Canal Authority. Now the ongoing work to further end the blockage of the Suez Canal will continue today, six days after the ship blocked one of the world's busiest trade routes, forcing companies to reroute ships and causing long tailbacks. It is estimated that $9.6 billion of goods are being held up each day. Now the 200 thousand ton ever given ran aground on Tuesday morning amid high winds and a sandstorm that affected visibility. Specialist salvage companies were brought in to help refloat the ship. On Sunday, canal officials began preparing to remove some of the 20,000 containers on board in order to lighten the load. The canal, which separates Africa from the Middle East and Asia, is one of the busiest trade routes in the world with about 12% of total global trade moving through it. It provides the shortest link between Asia and Europe. An alternative route around the Cape of Good Hope on the southern tip of Africa can take two weeks longer. Now joining me to break down the ramifications of the blocking of the Suez Canal is the managing director of River Lake, Nigeria, Belo Tukur. Belo, welcome to the show. First time in person, but welcome back again. Thank, Thank you so you. much for coming. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. So let's do a bit of a background on this. Um, the Egypt Suez Canal Authority, they're doing all they can to refloat the ever given as much as we see. Boats, uh, tugboats, dredgers, heavy earth moving equipment. What options do they have? Because right now, as we're hearing, they had to use this time of high tide uh, to get as much water in and under the ship as much as possible to try to refloat it. Are there any other options that you think they haven't explored yet? Um, no, that... Those are all the options that are available. Um, uh, the, the most important thing is actually to get the ship to be uh, even keel. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, once, and once that's done, uh, it can be able to be pulled. Um, uh, recently, uh, uh, a Dutch uh, salvage company was, uh, uh, was engaged to actually carry out the salvage operation. So I, I guess all hands are on deck to try and, uh, to try and get the ship freed. But, um, uh, but yes, the, the, uh, the worst thing that can happen is to actually try and uh, take, remove all the containers uh, on board the ship. So that would actually cause more disruptions. That would cause more disruption because what we're hearing is that that is the way for them to lighten the load of the ship so that it's easier for it to flow. But you're saying it will cause more disruption. How is that? Because it's going to take a bit of time because oh as it is now, we have a lot of uh, traffic actually building up. Um, uh, both on the um, on, on the on the south and the north band of the canal. Mm. So um, the if if uh, the salvage operation cannot be um, uh, concluded within the next couple of weeks, that should be the last resort. But I guess it's um, it, it shouldn't it shouldn't be what should happen just yet. Okay. I think it's uh, if it can be refloated. If since eighty percent of it has been refloated already, uh, so there's a high chance that it can be uh, rebalanced. Okay, so you said a couple of weeks. I'll come back to that because right. this is good news on a Monday, especially for international trade. Uh, but for you to really understand, this is a massive ship. It is just probably 100 or so meters smaller than the Empire State Building in New York. That's how big and long this ship is. Now, according to the Suez Canal Authority, which maintains and operates the waterway, the Suez Canal has closed just five times since it opened for navigation in 1869. In 2004, 2016, and in 2017, it was other boats. And the other two times was war and some issues as right. well. So I've been, some have said that this could have been avoided. And others have said its visibility was just altogether bad conditions coming together. Do you think that what happened with the Ever Given was something that was eventually going to happen with one ship or the other? Especially given the size of ships as we're moving now. This is one of the largest in the world. Okay, well, over the years, uh, global trade has increased. 
Um, and because of the increase in global trade, we have uh, bigger ships. Mm -hmm. The Panama Canal in the past couple of years have, um, have been expanded. Yeah. Uh, so now the, the Panama ships, as we call it, is now uh, the standard. A, a, it's now the standard. Mm. Um, so we have a, uh, the maximum ships that usually go around the Suez canals. We call them the Suez Maxis. So the Suez Canal has also gone um, uh, uh, its own uh, expansion. So this is just to show you the kind of uh, trade that is going on around the whole world. Um, well, we, we've had bigger ships in the past when we had the uh, Suez Crisis, uh, especially during the Arab-Israeli War. Um, uh, when the Suez Canal was actually blocked, that mm -hmm. was when there was like a huge economic impact. At that time, the, uh, the shipping community uh, built bigger ships, so we, we call them ultra-large uh, 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 crude carriers, if you like, because uh, it was uh, around the time that you know, there was still uh, high demand for oil. So those ships were actually being rerouted around the Cape of Good Hope. The only yeah. reason why we needed those bigger ships was to reduce the cost per ton for shipping. Um, so at the moment, um, uh, with this particular blockade, a lot of ships are going around the Cape, Cape. of Good Hope. Mm -hmm. So as they're going around the Cape, what is actually happening is the uh, uh, cost per ton is increasing. So which means uh, uh, freight costs are actually oh, going yeah. up, especially now that we have higher cost of uh, uh, prices of oil. Mm. It's also increasing the cost of uh, uh, bunker fuel for, for the ship owners. Um, on, 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 on the positive side, we have seen um, uh, uh, some ships actually being attracted to go east because of, uh, because of this particular blockade. Mm -hmm. But however, it's, um, it needs to be, it needs to, um, we'll, need, we'll need that to actually open as soon as, as possible. Soon as possible. Yeah. So a few things you've said, uh, ships going east, we'll also get into that in terms of what alternatives are there, what lessons are there. But let's talk about the Cape of Good Hope just a bit more. Now moving goods through the Suez Canal at about 10,000 nautical miles or about 18,000 plus kilometers or 25 and a half days. While you move goods via the Cape of Good Hope in South Africa, and that will take 13,500 nautical miles or about 25,000 kilometers, which is 34 days. Now, since winds from a sandstorm have been blamed for this disaster, Belo, do you think that the owners of Ever Given can de declare a force majeure? This is beyond, <laughs> it's obviously beyond anything that anybody would have imagined and yeah. uh, beyond Basically, you can almost say this is an act of God, if you would call it that. So can they declare a force majeure on the contents of the ship? Um, no, not yet. Um, not yet? Not yet, no. Okay. Uh, because, because they still have to actually um, explore all possibilities mm. of, uh, of actually uh, uh, salvaging the vessel. The only way there is, um, they, they can be a force majeure is if the actual voyage itself is, um, is, is compromised. So there's something we're calling shipping called general average. So in this case, when there's probably a, a very bad weather condition at sea, uh, especially when you're in, uh, you're in the deep sea mm -hmm. and maybe containers have to be jettisoned uh, from, from, uh, from, the, from the deck mm. just to save, save. the actual mm -hmm. maritime adventure. But in this particular case, it's not the case. So at least let's, we, they, they, we would have to try and see if it can be salvaged first. So the last resort would be to actually um, take out those containers on board. But then the beauty of it is they will not be jettisoned into yeah. the ocean, so they yeah. can still be salvaged, so that's okay. So we hear about 9.6 billion daily is being Correct. lost. Correct. Insurance companies, we're hearing many, many ships are tail back, are waiting to pass through. Where does insurance play a role, if any, in this kind of economic situation? Uh, well, there, there, there are two things. Um, fir first thing, um, there's also a security concern which hasn't been mentioned. Piracy. Because, yes. So now what is going to happen is all the ships have to more or less go 200 nautical miles if you're going through the Cape mm -hmm. um, to avoid piracy in the, uh, in the Gulf of Aden around the uh, Horn of Somalia. Uh, and that increases the cost of bunkers. And then, you know, there's something we pay called the kidnap and ransom insurance. Uh, so that would also uh, likely going to go up uh, in this in this situation. Uh, but as regards to uh, cargo insurance, mm. um, uh, well, all the cargo is uh, is more or less insured for for From total the very loss. Mm -hmm. Yes. So um, uh, so of course insurance companies wouldn't want to be in this particular position because right now a lot of the um, uh, a lot of the uh, uh, underwriters will be looking very closely at this to see how they can uh, increase the premiums.
Okay, so you've mentioned piracy. Let's take that on before we go for a, a quick break. So there are the fears. Uh, yes. For a number of years, we've seen the the trend of piracy move away from the Gulf of Aden into the uh, Gulf of Guinea here off the western coast um, on the continent here. Correct. But we're also seeing that if people have to go further down, if you look at the maritime websites right now, there is a massive blockade around the Cape of Good Hope. And that yep. also increases the more ships there, there, the more people are going to be attracted there. So what are we being told in terms of how shipping companies are trying to increase their security? Are they just waiting it out? Is it even possible to wait this out as it is right now? Well, no. Um, uh, there's there's uh, an international coalition anyway that already exists around the Gulf of Aden mm -hmm. that provides um, uh, escort, escort services, yeah. yes, for, for ships actually transiting, going through the canal. So all they just need to do now is just to have more warships around the area. Um, uh, we have the U.S. Navy, the Japanese, the Indian, as well as the British all involved in this uh, international coalition to, to stop uh, piracy. So, um, so, so yes, so that's, that's still effective. The only thing is they just need more, um, more ships to, mm -hmm. to guard the, uh, the goods. And that comes with extra cost as well. All right, we're Correct. going to take a quick break. When we come <laughs> back, there are numbers, so many numbers to discuss when it comes to the uh, blockage of the Suez Canal. 18,000 is one of those numbers. 51.5 is also one of those numbers. But another number is 14 million. Where do those numbers fall into place in this conversation? You'll find out when we come back. Stay with us. So more than 18,000 ships passed through the Suez Canal in 2020. That's an average of 51.5 ships per day. What other numbers did I tell you? The Suez Canal apparently also lost an estimated $14 million every day in transit fees. Billions of dollars of cargo was backlogged on over 350 ships that are still awaiting passage. Now, many of these ships were blocked from entry this week, and they carry sensitive products, including livestock destined for different countries in Europe and Asia. There are also worries that if it is not freed soon, that is the ever given, livestock, food, and water could run out on these vessels, spelling death for potentially thousands of animals. Other ships carried oil, which is a critical resource for several countries in the region. Syria actually imposed fill rationing on Sunday to safeguard dwindling oil supplies after tankers were unable to make deliveries due to the blockage. Now, Bilo, when you hear all of this, you're hearing in terms, you know, everyday Africans, everyday Nigerians, South Africans, we just go about our lives. We don't know how certain goods get to us, but there are many of the goods that we consume on the continent that pass through this canal. But now we're hearing about animals going different places. We're about oil as well. So at the end of the day, what is the larger impact of the evergreen as it continues right now, as we know it, to continue blocking the Suez Canal? Well, it's going to be a major impact. So we'll start seeing a lot of supplies in most of the retail outlets uh, uh, dwindling um, if this is not uh, resolved as quickly as possible. Um, there was already uh, a backlog of, uh, of container slots, especially for goods coming out of China at the back of the pandemic last year. So this has actually now contributed greatly to it, um, especially for the uh, Ever Given, which is a big, uh, uh, which is a Suez Max uh, sort of container, mm. container ship. Uh, it's, um, well, it's, it carries over, what, over 4,000 containers, and that's, uh, that's, that's a massive, um, it's that's, massive load. It's a massive load, correct. So we might start seeing uh, basic supplies like tissue paper, et cetera, especially in European countries. Uh, um, uh, running, running out of stock in the uh, retail markets. However, as regards to the animals, um, we have um, we have the Ramadan coming. Yeah. So um, uh, a lot of all this livestock is actually destined for mostly Middle Eastern countries mm. who who need this uh, livestock for the uh, for the halal for the halal meat. Mm. Um, uh, the the Europeans are not really uh, don't really transport livestock as much. Um, then as regards to, um, to Africa and how it's going to affect yes. us, that's going to be quite critical because we have some of these uh, containers actually going and transiting in the port of Algeciras, which is in Spain in the Mediterranean, to actually come down to, uh, to West Africa. So we might start seeing uh, uh, um, uh, some supply disruptions. Uh, IKEA, for example, have uh, have uh, uh, have a lot. They have the most containers on the ever mm. given, and they 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 might see a lot of supply disruptions in their own uh, supply chain as well.
So is there any way to safeguard against this? So as we said earlier, this sort of blocking of the Suez Canal doesn't happen often, but it has right. happened. Yeah. Is there any way as an individual country, as a region, to sort of find a way to safeguard against these type of supply disruptions? Well, uh, global trade is about supply and demand. Yeah. So um, the, the, the pandemic has not really helped. So for the fact that there was already a situation where there was a backlog of container goods that were meant to be delivered, what we are going to see uh, at this point is a reduction in uh, delays, more or less, uh, in terms of uh, uh, delivery of, uh, of goods, um, uh, which, is, which, which has already happened even before now. So the situation is just going to get a little worse. That doesn't sound good. No. I, I'm, I'm not hearing any good news except <laughs> for the fact that 80% course correcting. But we also have to definitely talk about when this whole situation will be over. But before that, let's talk about oil. According to data in February, 338 oil tankers transited the canal. This compares with a monthly average of 364 and 385 tankers in 2020 and 2019, respectively. As Belo said, the price of many commodities have been impacted by the grounding of the ever given, but particularly oil. We've had conversations about the OPEC Plus meetings. We saw what they decided just about two and a half, three weeks ago. But this situation is putting a different type of pressure, one that no one really anticipated on the oil price. What's happening with oil price in relation to the Suez Canal blockage? Okay, well, so um, we saw last week, just before the blockage, there was, uh, there was, uh, um, there was a drop in, in oil prices. But there was a bit of a rebound over the past couple of days. Yeah. Uh, but of, this is impacted by the blockade. However, the, um, uh, Germany is by going to a third wave of lockdown. And that might, uh, that, that's what has not really triggered the price of oil to go astronomically high mm -hmm. at this point. So with a lot of European countries still um, uh, in, in a lockdown phase, if you like, um, it, has not, it has not really impacted as much, especially with the reduction in the, um, in the, in the global supply of the commodity. Um, we will probably see within the next couple of weeks an increase in the price of oil and also increase in the price of shipping, mm. um, which, has, which has actually uh, started so, um, so yes, definitely, there will definitely be, uh, be an impact on this, especially if ships have to route through the Cape of Good Hope. So you've mentioned a few direct knockdown effects, and that has been the freight um, price that we've seen already, uh, kidnapping ra ransom pricing, if Correct. you can call it that insurance, as well, yeah. uh, insurance, and even pricing for some of the goods as well. But beyond that, those are the direct, and we've talked a bit about the indirect, the supply chain disruption, mm -hmm. and we might see some commodities or some goods in retailers also going up or becoming scarce because of this. So now let's put a timeline to this. Everyone is happy today. Uh, when the ship was actually refloated in Egypt, we heard shouts of God is good and people are very happy but it's not free it's just a part of the process Correct. and there are those who have said today could be the day do you think today is the day the ever given will be free well if if the, if the tide comes then mm -hmm. uh, then definitely yes uh, but the tide is also receding this high tide that they were waiting for <laughs> Belo, tell us the truth this high tide they were waiting for is actually yeah. now receding between now and tomorrow maybe early wednesday it'll be gone so if the ship is not freed by then mm -hmm. what happens yeah well um they just have to ensure that they they're able to maximize the tide mm. from the beginning until the end of the tide so if that's been able to be achieved then that should be able to refloat the ship um, then if the ship is, uh, is 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 refloated it can be towed towards the great bitter lakes um, and as also regards to uh, the congestion that will happen in the canal which has already happened that will probably take about three to four weeks to actually clear all that traffic coming in and out especially uh, ships coming uh, eastbound and those going west. While it's not like driving a car, I'm going to ask a very basic question. I would okay. just think, I know these ships are massive. Can't they just turn around and go another way? It's not as simple as that, obviously. No. So please explain. Yeah, well, uh, the, the ship is already in a particular canal. Mm -hmm. So, and it has, uh, th there are locks uh, in these canals and these, and these locks have a restriction. And because of that restriction, there's not enough room for the ship to maneuver. Okay. So as you can see, when the Ever Given actually... Um, uh, Turned a bit and hit the shore. Correct. Mm. So you, you can see that there's not enough room for her to maneuver because she's quite long. So, um, so yes, if it was probably a, a lot smaller ship, that would have been easier. Mm -hmm. But in this case, no. 
Okay. <laughs> He's smiling, but I don't know if it's a good smile for the global <laughs> economy. And you still have refused to give me a deadline. In your estimation, looking at everything that you know in your work, and then, of course, this situation, how long do you think the world has to wait for the Ever Griven uh, to be back, or to, at least to be out of the way? Well, optimistically, I believe um, within a week, okay. if they're able to refloat her, uh, the worst situation, like I said, is to... Uh, is to actually uh, remove the containers on board the ship. So, because that is going to take a lot of time, mm. and that will actually um, that will be the easiest option. Because if if they do that, it's it, they're going to reduce the uh, the draft the of the ship. Yeah. And it's easier for for her to actually refloat. But however, there will be a lot of disruptions in that particular if that option is taken, because that will take a lot longer. Okay, yeah. we'll be watching this. It is still an uh, interesting situation that's developing in the Suez Canal. And of course, you know that you can stay locked right here on New Central. We'll give you all of the updates as things happen. So what we know right now is seemingly with the dredging, with the tugboats, with a number of um, specialist salvage companies working with the Suez Canal Authority, the Ever Given has at least shifted in some regards. So if it breaks where to a situation where the ship is free, we will bring you that breaking news as it is. Velo Tukar, Managing Director of River Lake, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. Thank you for having me. All right, so we're going to wrap things up with NC4 to watch a few stories we are keeping our eyes on. And of course, we start nowhere else but the Suez Canal. Global shipping companies are redirecting their vessels to route around South Africa as the Suez Canal blockage continues. Merck and Mediterranean Shipping, or rather Shilling Company, have announced that two and 11 of their respective ships have been rerouted along South Africa, the Cape of Good Hope. Now, all retreated as salvage teams refloated the giant vessel that has been blocking the Suez Canal. The traders are weighing the impact of renewed lockdowns on energy uh, global consumption before an OPEC Plus policy meeting. Nigeria's Senate Public Accounts Committee has again summoned the management of the Nigerian National Petroleum Corporation over alleged non-remittance of 4.07 trillion naira to the Federation account between 2010 and 2016. And finally, the Nairobi Securities Exchange has reported a 109% increase in net profit for the year that ended December 2020. Its profit after tax increased to 167.9 million Kenyan shilling at the end of last year from 80.2 million Kenyan shilling in 2019, despite a 5% drop in revenue. And that's today's Business Edge, literally keeping you right there at the pulse of what is probably the biggest economic story around the world right now. If you missed any of our previous conversations on the continent's big uh, business and financial stories, head to our website or to our YouTube channel and check them out. Until next time, I'm Tolulakwe Adilaru Balogun. Have a good one.